Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Steve Donovan, the Director of Alumni Relations at Trinity College. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for another virtual Long Walk presentation, one we are especially excited about as it's the first one to come to you live from, an, from on campus and from a particularly iconic location. If the video introduction had been live, you would find the quad covered in a blanket of new snow this evening, still falling as we speak. We hope you are all safe and well and not too adversely impacted by the winter weather wreaking havoc across the country this week. About a year ago, Trinity was readying for two 50th anniversary celebrations, one for the Trinity Rome campus and the other for Cine Studio. Unfortunately, both were postponed, but that hasn't stopped us from bringing the celebration to you virtually for now and eventually in person in Italy. Next Tuesday night, we'll launch a virtual series of events celebrating the Rome campus. And then next year in 2022, we'll invite all of you to join us in Italy for a special Cine Studio film tour throughout the country, led by our panelists tonight, and a celebration in Rome on and around Trinity's iconic campus there. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's host and moderator, John Michael Mason. John Michael is a native of Nahant, Massachusetts. He's an honors graduate of Trinity College in the class of 2012 and has a master's degree in American studies from the college in 2014. John Michael is the head coach of the men's and women's track and field teams and was a national qualifier for the Bantams back in 2010 as a student. He is the founder and director of an acclaimed international film festival, aptly named Trinity Film Festival, which will have its 10th annual celebration this upcoming spring. And he also is currently serving his second term as the chair of the Cine Studio Board of Directors. It's all yours, John Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank Helder, Bonnie, all of your colleagues for uh, the virtual presentations you've been doing over the course of this school year. We are thrilled and honored to be a part of it. I am thrilled to be, as you say, in person in Cine Studio tonight. And though we wish that more of, of you could be here too during this uh, anniversary year, our 50th and 51st year just beginning, um, we were, though, thrilled to see so many names on the participant list of community members and former volunteers. Uh, so we're excited to give you a little bit of uh, a feel of the space today, tonight. So often you, we hear people uh, sort of wax poetic about the magic of the movies. But that magic is not just the story and the image on the screen, like the one in front of me. The magic also comes from the atmosphere and the presentation, the experience of being at the movies. In my humble and biased opinion, that magic is alive no better when seeing a film than going uh, through a cinematic journey at Cine Studio. So now I it is my honor to introduce the magicians behind the 50 plus years of this magnificent theater. Joining me tonight are our longtime co-executive directors and co-founders of Cine Studio, James Hanley and Peter McMorris. Good evening. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Uh, James is recently retired. For those who don't know, he has joined us on the board of directors, uh, making Peter the current sole executive director of Cine Studio, but he is soon retiring as well. So we are actually just recently launching a search for our new executive director, to usher in the next chapter of Cine Studio, and we look forward to the next 50 years. But starting with uh, all this discussion of the magic of the movies, I'd like to ask both of you a question that has nothing to do with Cine Studio specifically, or Trinity, or Hartford. What was the first movie theater experience that you can recall tonight where you really felt the magic of seeing a movie in a movie theater? Well, for me, um, I was uh, very fortunate to have a cinematically oriented babysitter who took me to see This Is Cinerama when I think I was seven, maybe eight, I'm not sure. But uh, I was growing up in London and uh, Mrs. Hopkinson, my, um, my babysitter, uh, bought advance tickets to This Is Cinerama. And I have to say it's an experience I think 
I was so immersed in it. If for those who don't know, Cinerama at the time in the 1950s, this was 1954, uh, Cinerama was this giant screen, curved screen with three projectors. And uh, the most famous scene in this is Cinerama is the uh, roller coaster ride. And for me, uh, I, I think I was totally, I felt where I wanted to be. And I think that that was what infected me with the movies and I never looked back. You do it, me, it was um, 1957. And uh, I don't know who I went with, but I know I was sitting in the second row of a very large theater with a very large screen and I was watching Jailhouse Rock. And the scene that just took me away was the uh, musical dance number that's done in the jail. And I remember just being lost at that point and just totally involved with the movie. Um, that was, from then on, I was hooked. Great. And for those who are um, alumni and former volunteers, they'll recognize that James is currently coming to us live from the projection booth and Peter is coming to us live from the Cine Studio office. So we're able to all safely be in person. I, I, I don't deserve to have this shot of the beautiful theater behind me, but I'm lucky to be placed here. Many of our former volunteers will recognize the office that Peter currently inhabits where James and Peter for literally 50 years have have run Cine Studio. I want to let people know tonight they can feel free to comment in the chat and leave messages for James and Peter that we can save at the end. But if you have a question to ask, put it in the Q&A feature and we will uh, look to get to those later in the discussion. We may cut things short a little bit tonight because the snow is coming down and we have to make sure that our, our founders can get home. But that makes me think as we were talking earlier uh, one of you made a comment of, well, it would be like the olden days if we're snowed in here. So in those early days or at any point, uh, what are some of the late nights you've had at Cine Studio or maybe even with weather been snowed in before? Well, I can remember actually sleeping on the floor in the theater precisely because of a, a snowstorm, um, certainly. And, and um, I think there are, there, there are all kinds of situations I can remember that were sort of unique. Um, the biggest thing I remember really is how many people sought out Sunny Studio. And, you know, when it's interesting, Peter's uh, experience with a large, large screen movie seeing Jailhouse Rock was not so different from mine, really. And I think when we met at Trinity, um, actually, we discovered we had spent some of our childhood not one town over in London, um, didn't know each other then. But we had some common experiences. But I think when we were both starting out, we both came to Cine Studio. We found this auditorium. and We immediately thought this was where cinema needed to be. Uh, there needed to be a big screen. There was a big auditorium with a, with a balcony. And this was something that was really amazing to discover and to share. And we got together with a like-minded group of people. And I think things like sort of sleeping on the floor uh, because of the snowstorm, but that wasn't the only reason. One reason was we were up all night with, I think, 40 or 50 students on ladders because the screen was delivered the night before we were to open one year. And uh, we had to work all night. And we had people painting the frame and hanging the screen. And in a famous moment, uh, the audience started coming in the following evening while we were still hanging the screen. So Peter, what year was that that you guys were, were hanging all that yourself as students? Um, that was early 70s, I think early 72, 73, somewhere around there. There are um, certainly some people in attendance who who know the, the history of, of Sin Studio and, and some of the old stories, but Every time I hear you guys tell some of these stories, I learn something new. So we'll, yeah. we'll certainly re rehash uh, some of that tonight. What is, what is the latest night that you can remember, Peter, that wasn't a, a building experience where you guys were putting the theater together? The latest night is probably, probably the snowstorm in the late 70s, I think, where we 
we were off campus at the time and the snow was so bad that we couldn't go home. But it turned into basically a party the, old, the whole night. We showed the movie, we all watched the movie and then we kind of found a spot in the theater to spend the night. And I don't know how this happened, but we ended up having a snow fight, snowball fight in the theater. Someone brought snow in and started throwing snowballs. <laughs> and eventually it kind of got out of hand, but uh, it was a fun night. <laughs> now, there are obviously, as you both always point out, um, it was more than the two of you who, who started the theater. Who were some of those, those early founders of, of the feast and, and how would you describe the, the Motley crew? Well, I think that it started out with the people in the Trinity Film Society. That was the group that we were all members of. And um, many of the, I, I think there were seven founders total who uh, they, we were working on things together at the beginning. And um, they were all people who were fascinated with film. I mean, you, you, it's hard to describe now with so many sources of media, how important film was to all of us and how it was so exciting to watch everything from uh, to the things like Italian neorealist cinema, some Hollywood films. There were so many things and, and I think we were all so excited by it. Um, we had uh, one, uh, there was one of our founders who was so enamored of Dracula and the Dracula films, which we showed as midnight horror films. He would actually dress as, uh, the, as, as Bela Lugosi playing Dracula. And um, he had an extraordinary appearance about him. Uh, he just uh, actually clicked with the audience. We would have a sellout crowd and we had um, in the theater at the time, there were windows in the side of the auditorium which had rolling metal shutters that uh, we, at the beginning of the midnight show, um, uh, Randy Mann would come down uh, to the front of the show, to the front of the theater and insert a key into the switch and turn the key and these clanking metal shutters would, would start rising towards the ceiling and the audience just went wild, screaming their heads off. This was a full house and he'd be dressed for the part and then the show would begin. Um, it was a, just a, one illustration of the dedication of the, the kind of people. And I think we all so enjoyed picking films and, and programming and finding out ways to introduce people to the film. There were so many people who discovered cinema at Sony Studio and I think that we, Peter and I, and the, the other members at the starting, we were learning how to be curators, how to make an interesting program, how to get the audience to come out. I got involved, I think it was Larry Styers, who was the head of the Film Society, at that point had a class in filmmaking. And he would give you these, uh, I think there were super eight millimeter cameras back then and you had to go out and make the movie and that's how I met other members of the film society and it was just about I, I came to the to the college at the right time because that was the year that we discovered the space so um I think I owe a lot to Larry just for uh, introducing me to like member students. Yeah, <laughs> there we are in this very office. And um, he taught uh, filmmaking. He wasn't a full-time professor, he, but uh, he was, uh, I think, responsible for just getting all the students together to, to at the right time to, to uh, start, uh, start the theater, I think. Great. I, it was interesting that um, I think uh, one of the extraordinary things was when we first discovered uh, Cine Studio and most exciting of all, we discovered that it had a projection booth, which was something really exciting for us. We, we, we actually came in here and we found 35 millimeter projectors and um, it was such an exciting moment. Uh, 
they were covered in dust, all cobwebs. They probably hadn't been run, we think, uh, since the late 1930s. And uh, so we, uh, to cut a long story short, we contacted National Theatre Service, National Theatre Supply, uh, a man named Ralph Morrow, who was intrigued. He came up from Hamden and uh, he developed a plan to clean up the projectors and to put them into operation so that we could show films. But unfortunately, we didn't have the $2,500 it would cost. And so Larry Stiers <laughs> stepped forth and he used his own money to help pay for the, the, that startup. And we were able to actually run films on those very same 35 millimeter projectors that had stood unused for so long. Amazing. I know that uh, Ron Cotero, a friend of the theater, sent in a question, made a joke about you guys being magicians and, and the magic spells you used uh, to somehow in, in tight fundraising and, and budgetary scenarios. But, but Peter, tell us briefly the story. Uh, for those who don't know, it's worth hearing uh, of you, you know, briefly, you guys breaking into the theater and then, or break, you know, discovering the space, perhaps I should say, and then somehow securing a loan to build what we see here today. Yeah. Um, this space was not being used by the, by the college because the acoustics were so bad. Um, uh, James, the, the big, the, the big discovery was the, was the uh, projectors in the, in the booth. Nobody, we could not find a key for that door. So eventually we ended up taking the door off the hinges and getting into that space. When we got up there, we discovered two 35 millimeter projectors that had been given to the college in the 1930s. Never used as far as we know, just sitting there, uh, these were simplex projectors, which at the time were still, even in the 60s, the, the, the most used projectors available because they were so well built. So we set about, James had worked for Cinerama in London, so he had experience with, with, um, with projectors. So he and I, and about as six other people, stripped the whole the whole projector down to the bare bones, oiled, polished, and then reassembled them. And thankfully they worked, I think the first time. And the first, the first time we saw a picture on the screen, there were a bunch of us working in the theater. I think James was up projecting. The first time we saw a picture on the screen, the whole place just went silent. Everybody just stopped what they were doing and just stared. It was just magnificent seeing a picture on that screen. Um, but uh, those, those are memories that will never go away. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I mean, I, I think it was a really, I mean, talking about magicians, it was just a magical time. Um, I think that, that things came together. It was a time when people were really curious about film. People hadn't seen a lot of films in theaters uh, with really good projection quality because that was our first, uh, absolutely our first goal was to show films at a standard that other theaters just didn't, simply didn't do. We were going to do the very best. And not coincidentally, we had to overcome the bad acoustics in the auditorium and create what is now considered to be one of the best sounding theaters in the country. Um, it, it took a long time to find out how to do that. But when we first came in, we had that sort of excitement about that. And I well remember that first moment when the projectors worked and it was like, this was it finally. And I think, I don't know, for me, it was certainly like, <laughs> this was the focus of life for I don't know how many years. <laughs> Now, when you guys started Cine Studio, it, it was a time of, of social unrest on the campus and, and in the country. And, and back then, we perhaps didn't have the visionary leadership we have today at, at the college. So I, I've heard that there were some butting heads back at the, during the early days. Tell us about that or to phrase it in a more positive light. Um, what, what did 
the students who started the Cine Studio. What, what did you guys stand for and what did Cine Studio mean to you? Well, I, I would say um, it, 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 that's one of the crucial parts of the beginning of Cine Studio is its social function. Um, I think that when we first started out, uh, Trinity was in very much a state of turmoil, uh, that things were external, but also internal. And I think that the, um, the idea of a group of students like the Film Society, picking the films without asking anybody's permission, um, with actually being students being able to join the Film Society and do things without being told what to do. I mean, we really had what amounted much more to a cooperative than anything else. Everybody did what they could do and they learned how to do it and they expressed themselves in all sorts of ways. And in, in a lot of ways during that time of turmoil, I think that um, virtually all of the students were sort of on the edge of discovering something new about themselves. And that included people, uh, uh, people who, gay people who were closeted. There were people of color here who hadn't quite fitted in. There were people of every different background who all seemed to end up at Sunny Studio. And there was nobody really in charge. I mean, there was a sort of basic direction. I think Peter and I were uh, giving a sort of rough uh, uh, sense of direction, but mostly it was people doing things and discovering things themselves. And I think that it was a turning point in the country about not just doing things that you were told to do, but discovering new things. And at the same time, many of the people who worked at Sunny Studio at the time were people who were demonstrators against the Vietnam War, for example, which wasn't an especially popular view at Trinity at the time. And I think that this was a a sort of outflowing of confidence that took place in the context of cinema, if that makes sense. Yeah, that was during the Vietnam War. So there was a lot going on on campus and Cine Studio was kind of, this was the largest space on campus. So there were a lot of anti-war meetings going on here and gatherings and, you know, kind of showed movies that reflected how we felt about the war. Um, so there was always uh, discussions after the shows. Um, and it was, there was a lot of activity um, outside of just watching movies here at that time too. Well, there's so many things that I want to get to tonight. Cognizant of not not going on too long, but give people who don't know a sense of what it was like to see a movie at Cine Studio for many decades even, but uh, you know, these days movie theater attendance is down even pre-pandemic across the country, of course, but when you say Cine Studio was the largest space on campus and a sort of a center of social life, I'm not sure everyone really knows what you mean when you say that, so tell us a little more, Peter and, and James as well. Well, we used to show double features to start. You, you never saw just one movie here. You always were able to see two films. And we would not, we would show double features and then repeat the double feature. So we would start, you know, early, early evening. And sometimes we would end up at four o'clock in the morning, depending on how long the, the double features were. And we didn't restrict our features to length. So if we had a three hour movie, we would still show another movie with a three hour movie. So it would end up being like a five hour show. And at that time, James, James learned projecting in England and then he taught me here. We were the only two who were projecting. So we do shifts. He would come in and do one movie or one double feature, and then I would come in and do the other. But the thing that was satisfying is you'd look at the projection booth, and whatever time of day it was, there was always a big crowd, and they were always attentive to it. Of course, there was always smoke in the air. There was smoking allowed in the theaters back then, but it was it was so exciting. It made you 
it encouraged you to, to keep going because you would always have an audience who were attentive to what was ever what was on the screen. So you felt that you you know what you were doing was important. And and we're talking. This theater has more than 450 seats, so we're, we're talking yeah. hundreds. Yeah. Almost. Well, it, now it does, but then it had almost 500. So. <laughs> Yeah, right. And you weren't getting paid either at the beginning. No. no. <laughs> it was strictly volunteer work. It was strictly volunteer, yeah. One of the interesting things, you know, you were asking about the, the, the experience in the theater. Um, when we were first planning, when Peter and I were talking with the um, suppliers and we were looking at plans for the theater, one of the things we needed to do was to get a big screen a new big screen because the original screen in the theater was a postage stamp. It was about 10 feet across. And so uh, this specification that came officially from National Theater Supply, um, we just both felt was just not big enough. <laughs> so we figured, okay, what can we fit in there? What's the biggest screen we can fit in within that space, within the proscenium? And can we get it down to as close as three feet to the floor and get it up to the ceiling? We really wanted to have that experience be a, a spectacular picture and with multi-channel sound, of course, too. Yeah, um, we, but I we wanted but, a bigger picture, too, at the same time, yeah, yeah. which the 35 millimeter projectors couldn't do. Yeah. <laughs> so the purchase, the, you know, the purchase of the new screen went along with the purchase of the new projectors, which we went from 35 millimeter to 70 millimeter. How do you afford that? Uh huh. Well, <laughs> we a whole bunch of long-haired hippies went down to then Connecticut Bank and Trust and walked into a loan officer's office and uh, we asked, you know, could we borrow forty thousand um, dollars? And I, I think Larry in particular didn't think that that was going to happen. Well, we walked out with not only a check but the loan repayment book. I think within two hours from the bank. And uh, it turned out later that the bank was hoping to curry favor with Trinity, but uh, they had ulterior motives in other words, but it was extraordinary to us with that money, we were able to buy the curtain, the uh, custom woven carpet with the lion woven into it. And we were able to buy seats and also 70 millimeter projectors. And the first thing we showed here was 2001 A Space Odyssey in a Cinerama print. Well, tell us more about the, the connection with Stanley Kubrick. Uh, you know, there's some great stories of certain films we've shown here and of <laughs> directors. This is one of them. Well, um, we had uh, later on, we had made a deal with Warner Brothers to show A Clockwork Orange, which I think at the time, uh, certainly for me and Peter, that was the film we wanted to show. And we were so excited to be showing it. And so you can imagine how crestfallen we were uh, just a couple of days before Warner Brothers called and said, no, we couldn't show it because it's going to show at another local theater, um, which wanted to get it and they wanted an exclusive. So I happened by chance to have uh, <laughs> Stanley Kubrick's home telephone number. Um, and so we called from, from the office, we called Stanley Kubrick and he answered the phone. And uh, we talked for about 20 minutes. We told him what happened. We told him how we loved his films. And we said how disappointed we were. And uh, anyway, he said, well, let me see what I can do. Um, I'll get back to you. Well, the next morning, it turned out that he had called Ted Ashley, the head of Warner Brothers, head of, I think he was the uh, head of the company then. And uh, he said, we had to get the film, this little tiny theater, <laughs> or now with a bigger footprint, this theater, Cine Studio in Hartford was going to get it. So we then got this call from the local Warner Brothers branch in Boston who said, oh, I don't know what you did, but we got a call, you've got the film. And uh, we showed the film and to a huge crowd. Um, and it was incredibly successful. It looked fantastic on our screen. And ever since then, for decades afterwards, people in the industry and in locally and in the, in, the, in the distributors would make jokes about how they shouldn't cross us because we'll call the director. We actually recorded that 
that telephone conversation yeah. uh, on a reel-to-reel tape. <laughs> However, I, it's somewhere here and we don't know where it is, <laughs> but there is a recording of that somewhere in his office. Yeah. Now, a more modern day um, director who, who's obviously a fan of Stanley Kubrick is Christopher Nolan. And we've been able to show his film in 70 millimeter with some cajoling or whatever the right word is. What, what have those conversations been like to be able to show Interstellar and some of the other films he's had and get it here in 70? Well, those, those were not direct conversations with Christopher Nolan himself. They were indirect in that when we called Paramount, for example, um, and uh, that we we had a good friend as a, a representative in Paramount Pictures, and uh, he said that uh, he would he he couldn't guarantee that we could get it, but uh, he invited us to send a, a a description of Sydney Studio and why we wanted to show it. Uh, that he could show to Christopher Nolan because Christopher Nolan is unusual as a filmmaker in that he's intimately involved in the physical distribution of film prints. Um, he always makes sure that physical film prints are made, not only in 70 millimeter vertical, uh, which we show at Sony Studio, but also IMAX. And he's, he's intimately involved with all those things. So he said that we could actually use the print that had been reserved for him. And so we were able to do that. And uh, it was one of those things that uh, it was such a satisfaction that there was somebody in the production field who cared about the theater and that the theater that really took so much trouble because there were really not that many theaters in the country who either cared to show it in 70 millimeter or who had the expert people who would make it look good the way the director wanted. A couple of years ago, we were one of, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of I think only six or seven theaters in the whole country to screen Roma in 70 millimeter. It came out on Netflix, had a short theatrical run and had an even shorter 70 millimeter run. How did that come about? How did we end up connecting with Netflix, Peter? And how did they know that we were a venue of only six you know, states, six cities in the whole country to show that film in, like, in that manner? Peter? Um, I don't remember. I don't remember why. I think at that time, there was a lot of back and forth about it. I think that was one of the first films that Netflix wanted to release. They wanted to release it uh, streaming first, and they got such a backlash from the directors uh, and Hollywood about that, that they felt they had to release it, um, release it in theaters. We, we've always been, I mean, we keep our ears open for any opportunity to show 70. Um, and we were on to that very early. We if we hear about a 70 print, we usually start making calls right away and we keep making calls. So, you know, by the end of, uh, by the end of the day, most distributors say, oh, let them have it because they won't stop calling us because we won't, <laughs> we, uh, we, we uh, are convinced that um, that is the best way to see a movie is in a theater with as big a picture as you can get because it's, it, it is totally involving when that happens. And I've watched, I have watched that Roma now on Netflix and it really does not compare to what we showed in this theater uh, a few years ago. Right. Yeah, I think actually 70 millimeter is an example of really the one of the major peaks of cinema generally the sex 70 millimeter technology and for those who are not familiar is most movies that were shown on film would be shown on 35 millimeter wide film and 70 millimeter is twice as wide so you can make a bigger picture with less magnification so the picture is much sharper the sound is better everything about it is better 
And I think for the future, it's an interesting thing that I, I think that there will be filmmakers who know that, filmmakers who will rediscover it. And there will also be classic uh, revivals of films that theaters like Sydney Studio will be able to do because those 70 millimeter projectors are not very often in operation in other theaters. And so Sydney Studio has a very special place in the country being one of those theaters that uh, are probably fewer than a hundred actually around the country that can show 70 millimeter and who can convince filmmakers that it's really worthwhile to actually distribute that way. And uh, I think that that's something will become very special in the future because people, generations of people now are used to seeing films on smaller screens. And if you can get them to come in and look and see what a big picture looks like in a theater, a darkened theater, um, and see it with the best technology, it's a stunning experience, unequaled. We, we do have some questions in, in the chat about, or in the Q and A about the, the future of cinema. Now, of course, uh, we also have digital projection at, at Cine Studio and have it at the highest standard digitally as well. How did that come about? You know, it seems like forgotten history now, but there was a moment where theaters like ours were in danger of not existing anymore because of the rush to go to go digital. Tell us briefly how we came out the other side of that with one of the best digital projectors in the state of Connecticut. Well, we actually, I, I think that we, we had maybe six months, whether we could, we didn't know when we heard what was happening. I mean, digital cinema had hung out there for many years, but then all of a sudden, when it began to happen, the big distributors and the big theater circuits came up with a plan whereby they would install digital cinema very quickly in their theaters, and they would not take on board the small fry, the art house theaters, places like Sydney Studio. There was no plan to help us financially. Um, and uh, there was a very real danger we would have to close because as soon as digital cinema took off, the film company started making fewer and fewer physical prints. And so it was harder and harder to get physical prints. So we were really, really pressed. And uh, we were very lucky with a major assistance from a donor who started, who kickstarted the process, who was horrified that we might have to close. And uh, it, it kickstarted the process. And uh, we then were able to get grants and we were able to raise enough money to put in extremely high level, the very best of digital cinema we were able to put it in in time, just in time, literally. I mean, with months, a couple of months to spare. And um, we kept all the film equipment, of course, and everything is kept up to date so we can always show film. But um, we came in just under the wire with digital cinema at a very high standard. And of course, without it, we could not have continued to exist. There are a lot of great questions coming in in the Q&A, so I want to to get to that. Uh, before we pivot to that, Peter, what's one of your favorite, both of you, we'll start with Peter, one of your favorite um, events at Cine Studio where a filmmaker came, or, or a couple of them that come to mind? What's some of the first ones that come to mind where a filmmaker came in the space? I guess my favorite was Sim Benny. Um, you know, great, legendary, African director that we, I mean, we've, sh we've shown all his films, but um, uh, I was just in awe when, she, when I saw him walk down the aisle. Um, this is just a few years before he passed away, unfortunately, but he was brought here by the, uh, by the French Film Festival. Um, and he was doing a tour of the Northeast. And he came and I, I think we showed Black Girl. Uh, and then he answered questions after and uh, was very gracious. Uh, to me, it was like royalty coming to the studio. Yeah, I, th I agree. That was a really, truly memorable occasion. I, I, I think over the years, those sort of things, uh, you know, 
are, are like the frosting on the cake in a way. I mean, you're, you're fascinated with the films you show, but when a filmmaker like that comes along, um, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's a great satisfaction and really fascinating to hear, the, hear what they have to say. Um, I, one of my uh, strongest memories was Michael Moore coming uh, to show his film, The Big One, um, and he had agreed to show the big one in particular because he, we talked his ear off about Sydney Studio and about how Hartford was a great place to show it because there were so many people who were pressed for income. They were they were low income and people who really cared about life who really wanted to see this film. And so we had it arranged. Then uh, it got taken away by the distributor. Um, uh, but Michael Moore fought for us and he came anyway. And when he walked in the theater after the, uh, uh, when the show was over, a full house just erupted and people were just so happy to see him. And he was so linked with the audience. It was a real example of a connection with a filmmaker and social movement and the audience. And uh, he, he, he stayed for hours afterwards. He didn't leave until after one o'clock in the morning uh, conversing with people and he brought his book along it was a really amazing experience, and we've had a number of filmmakers over the years. You know, he's uh, the, some really extraordinary visitors, but that one certainly stood out for me. We could talk online about those visits, and if people have questions about them, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat. And all the messages coming in on the chat are amazing, uh, and supportive of Jane yeah, here, and all a lot of a lot of old names there. <laughs> <laughs> from even from the very first years we opened, I can wow. see people I haven't heard from in years. That's exciting. Well, definitely. Well, feel free, everyone, to, to post in the chat. We will save that at the end so James and Peter can read all of it. I look forward to reading them as well. Uh, a question about the future of the film industry that is on everyone's mind. Joyce Maroney sent in the question about uh, even pre-pandemic theaters are struggling to compete with, with streaming. What do you think uh, the role of the movie house will play five years from now? Peter? I, I have, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's something that anybody who's in this industry right now is asking. Um, I, I, I really don't know. Um, what it's felt like this past year is that something's changed something's happened. Um, what it is, I don't know, but I think film in the coming years is not going to be the same as it was in 2019. I think we've, we've it's almost, you know, it's almost a changeover from film to digital. You kind of, you know, I remember James reading an article, there was some announcement that was made by one of the distributors. And right away you knew, okay, we have to change over. This is somewhat like that, but I don't know what's, what the change is. But I think in the past year, something has changed. I, I do agree with that. I think something has changed, but I, I think that it's actually a change that will turn out for the better for theaters like Sydney Studio, art house theaters, but particularly places like Sydney Studio, which are so dedicated to a very broad range of film, everything from the most obscure to the most popular. Um, I think that the number of theaters is going to be smaller because I think that the industry is sort of splitting, that you'll have the blockbusters, which will be uh, they'll be streaming at almost the same time they're in theaters. But I don't think that that's really a surprise. For many years, for example, the theater chains have not been about showing films. They've really been about selling food, which they sell 10 times as much in at least more than that now, I think, uh, in terms of uh, volume, uh, dollar volume, than they do movie tickets. And so um, that side of the industry has always been very different, at least for the past 30 years. And I think that operations like Cine Studio will become very special uh, in the way that we have a, 
it's not a mass audience, but it's an incredibly dedicated audience, people who will go for a long distance to see a film shown under the right conditions, to see a film that maybe other theaters don't show, or to see a classic film restored. I think it'll be a small number of theaters, a smaller number of theaters, but I think um, a, a new generation of people in Cine Studio will be dealing with a lot of different things that, that affect the actual showing of the films. But I think the demand from the audience, it'll be sort of akin to a kind of film institute operation, which I think is very unusual for a small city like Hartford. And I think it's really something that will be a strength in the future. Mm. Yeah, we're, you know, a, a more picky consumer, if they're going to leave the couch, you know, why not see a movie in a place like this? Otherwise, maybe stay home. So I, I like your sentiment, James, that there's some optimism of it might hurt the movie theater chain a lot if they don't have the concessions coming in. But we don't rely on concessions. We rely, we rely on community wanting to see a, a movie in the best possible atmosphere. And that's not yes. going away. And I think, I, I think that the paradigm is different for it too. When we first started in 1970, there were no video recorders, there were no uh, ways of seeing film outside of movie theaters really. And we started showing movies, more interesting movies under better conditions. And we were able to make enough money to put in really good equipment and to keep the theater going. And then we met up with various challenges like uh, video recorders came in and then DVDs and all kinds of challenges which certainly affected the audience and I think that we began to change over time in that people saw Sony Studio as being something to support with something beyond ticket sales for example to realize that in order to bring out something like a film festival it was a very expensive thing to do but they really wanted that they wanted that experience and I think that there is that core of support um, and we're not alone. I mean, around the country, there are art theaters who have that kind of passionate support. And I use that word advised, advisedly. I think it's the same passion that Peter and I had when we started out. We have, a, uh, again, a lot of great questions. This one from David Berzan, who was a student along with me. I would love to hear about Sinistio's influence on developing cult classics in the 70s, like Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> Pink Flamingos, Harold and Maude. Take a stab at any of those. <laughs> well, Harold, well, Harold and Maude and, uh, and uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show are probably the most uh, uh, sort of discovered films for us that when we wanted to show Rocky Horror Picture Show, it had opened and closed in New York City in less than a week, which in the film industry at the time was unheard of. Everything played at least a week. And this closed it out. And so we called up, uh, we heard by the grapevine that, well, this was an interesting film to see. And uh, uh, so, and I had heard from some people that, you know, they would go down to New York City and see it. And so we called up 20th Century Fox and they said, oh, you don't want to show that. It's really bad. It's really dirty. It's really like, uh, so we would, we would say, oh, great. You know, <laughs> we really want to see it. So they sold it to us that first time for $35 flat. No, I mean, which again, you might get a $35 flat film if it was like worthless part of a double feature that nobody wanted to show. But anyway, we ran it and we noticed this bunch of people down front, a small group of people who knew the script and who were talking back to the screen. Well, of course, the rest is history, and uh, it then started to take off in other theaters, but we were one of the first, and uh, we brought it back, back probably many dozens of times, and uh, we had packed houses for it, and the audience was, it was just amazing to sit in the audience for a film like that, where uh, they would know the script, and they would all be talking back to the screen, and they would bring playing cards to throw in the air, and, and it was just, just amazing. And uh, the um, uh, Harold and Maud was a, a similar thing that when we called Paramount about that, they also convinced us, they said, oh, it's a really disgusting story about an 80 year old woman who has an affair with an 18 year old kid. It's really disgusting. You don't want to show it. Everybody will hate you for it. Uh, well, they didn't. And um, 
I still remember vividly the time when Bud Court turns to the audience after creating a phony self-immolation and he looks at the camera and the audience just leaps out of their seats. They laugh their heads off because that was one of the very rare times that a protagonist actually looked at the camera. But he looked at the camera with such a conspiratorial glint in his eye. It was just a wonderful moment. Peter, a favorite movie for you in, in the space, whether it's one of these cult classics or the Zoom filmmaker? Oh, I have a lot of favorite movies. Um, uh, don't try and pin it down to a favorite. Uh, it's it's hard to pin it down. Yeah, don't, that's too, what, what came to mind? What came to mind? In the space? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm looking through all these comments here. <laughs> um, I mean, Night of this. Yeah, Someone remembers Night of the Living Dead, which I do too, <laughs> showing that. Again, you know, this is the space that I saw most. Of, I, I usually never went to other movie theaters once we started. Um, uh, I always sat in this theater to watch them. Um, so every I can I, if I, it, you'd have to narrow it down to the year I think for for a favorite movie um, uh, this year uh, for instance um, I we showed Manx which again is one of these streaming movies but I thought it was a pretty incredible movie uh, for a theater I mean there was so much detail in that movie that maybe you, you have to have a, some sense of film history to, to see them, but it's, it's really rich with, with references that uh, uh, experiencing it in a theater, uh, you see all of them. Uh, again, uh, it's not something you're going to see on a TV screen, I think. Yeah. There's an anonymous question any long-standing Sin Studio traditions that are still in play? You can take that any way you like. If there are certain traditions that that some might know about that might be lost to history if you guys don't tell us them right now. Well, I would say the principal one is that Sin Studio still operates on most levels as a cooperative in that the students who come to work and volunteer and basically work for nothing because they love movies and they love the social experience of running the theater. I think that was one of the top things that Peter and I always felt we hoped would continue. And it has done through the 50 years and continues that it provides something of the same experience that we had when we started out in 1970. In other words, not a hierarchy where somebody told you all the time what to do, just somebody who showed you how to do things and then you take it in whatever direction and, and you make things work a certain way. And this has provided opportunities for students to learn management, how to deal with the public, how to deal with fractious audience members, how to deal with ex enthusiastic <laughs> audience members, talking with people. There are so many experiences and I'm glad that that, to me, that's one of the best things that has stayed about Sydney Studio that it's, I guess it really is a tradition. <laughs> And I think our longest one is food. You, you, you still don't sell any candy. <laughs> if, if you're, you know, if you're coming to the theater, what you come for is the film. So uh, we, we don't sell popcorn and we don't sell candy. And we, I mean, we did flirt with it for a period in our history, but we thought the distraction was just it was personally too much, so we said no, <laughs> no more food, no more, no more popcorn. Right, we and we actually had letters from audience members who said how they loved the fact that we stopped having food and that you could just come and listen to a movie and hear the hear the soundtrack and people weren't eating. People really loved that. We're uh, almost out of time here, but just I get great comments in the chat. I'm trying to keep up. Um, give us a, a, a sense of, of what you think Sin Studio means to the Hartford community and what it means 
to Trinity because of that relationship to the Hartford community? Well, I, I would say um, SUNY Studio has really been, it's not just Hartford, it's been the whole state. But I think one of the extraordinary things, the evolution over time was that Trinity was often a place which was seen as being aloof from the local community and Sydney Studio right from the beginning brought in lots of people from outside mixed with the student audience and people really got to meet each other. You really got to, if you were a student, you got to meet other people. You'd hear about film, you'd talk about film. People had that communication. And I think that um, one of the things that's really remarkable about Trinity in, it, in Hartford is how over the years, the relationship with the city has changed and it's become a part now, especially a part of the community and the local community is actually starting to be linked in ways that hasn't happened before. And I think Cine Studio, because of its independence of, of programming, the all sorts of different genres of film that we're showing, um, people could come. We had people who came as high school students and then who eventually went to film school and went to, uh, went to work in the film industry. Um, those sort of things um, are really linked to the whole community of Trinity, of the community of learning, of expanding your view of the world and bringing in all sorts of unexpected things, seeing films you wouldn't otherwise have seen and meeting people who have a different view. You know, uh, an indication of the strength of the community in, in, the, in the history of Cine Studio was the mailing list. We, we, at the very beginning, we bought a little space in the Hartford Current where people could put their name and address and send it in to us and we would add them to our mailing list. I think we got a few hundred, but throughout the years, it's grown to thousands and thousands and thousands. Uh, and if you draw a circle around Hartford, that's where they mostly are. Mm. So I, I think um, the fact that we, we don't advertise, we don't run ads in the paper every week, but people make the effort to find out what we're showing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Peter, a last, uh, uh, start with you, Peter. We have to finish up here. We. Hopefully it's not snowing too bad outside. One of the panelists alerted us that it, you know, snow is still coming down. But we have all these alums on here, members of the community, the Greater Hartford community, the Trinity community. Um, and this is a rare opportunity to talk to more people than we normally would be able to. What do you have to say to, to some of the fans of Cine Studio that are watching tonight? Well, I'm blown away by all these names that are popping up in the chat. I mean, <laughs> these are, <laughs> it's, it, it, uh, it's kind of humbling <laughs> um, because these these names go back 50 years, uh, some of them. So uh, you know, to be still, to be still. Uh, I mean, some of the comments are really strong. I mean, the influence that they say Sydney Studio has had. So it, it's it's quite humbling to see this. James, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Peter. I, it, I think it's extraordinary. And I, I would say um, for the future that this once this virus is over, Cine Studio will be back with its regular programming. And I would say to people to, to spread the word, let people know. One of the things about not being able to afford advertising is that we are something of a secret to a lot of people. And so make sure you tell people and tell people what Cine Studio is and maybe get some, bring some friends along who've never had the experience of a big screen in a beautiful space with incredible sound and actually introduce them to it. And I think the future for Cine Studio will be very bright with that kind of support. Certainly, uh, I sometimes hear we're the best kept secret in Hartford. We don't want to be secret coming out the other side of this pandemic that's for sure well we're really glad for all the people who came out tonight that's for sure yeah and i do remember the love story countdown <laughs> <laughs> all 
All right. Thank you, everybody. This has been amazing. We're going to, the people on the back end, Helder, uh, Steve, Fani, I know Helder's going to try and save uh, this chat. So those last couple of messages coming in from so many great friends and former coordinators and volunteers. Uh, this is great. And, and what a tribute to James and Peter. For, for those who haven't been to the theater in a while, we now have a, a, new, a newly minted plaque in the, in the lobby that we installed just before the new year. And President Joanne Berger Sweeney came by and we, we unveiled a, a surprise plaque from the board of directors to James and Peter. And uh, that's you know just the tip of the iceberg of the thanks that, that we owe them and their enduring legacy. So please support the theater, come see movies here, check out what we're showing at cinestudio.org and we hope to see you all soon. And thanks to all of the alumni for all of those years for making it such an incredible experience. Yes, thank you. Have a great night, everybody.